Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Cynthia Overton, and like Elizabeth said, I'm a principal research analyst with the American Institutes for Research. Uh, I am joined by my fellow panelists, uh, my old friend, uh, Mr. Matt Kaplowitz, uh, old meaning we've known each other for a while, not that he's old. <laughs> and my new friend, and I'm sorry, Matt is a partner, uh, is a founding partner and director of technology and content innovation with Bridge Multimedia. Uh, and then my new friend, Nancy Proctor, who is the head of mobile strategies and initiatives with the uh, Smithsonian Institution. So, welcome. Uh, I'd like to start the day off uh, really by uh, thank you all, thanking you all for participating um, in today's activities and particularly with our panel on universal design with mobile technology. Um, we'll start off the panel with Matt and um, Matt will be providing us an overview of factors to consider uh, as you enhance accessibility in your cultural institutions with mobile technology. Uh, and then Nancy will then talk about a really cool initiative going on uh, at the Smithsonian that has implemented um, accessibility features to enhance the museum experience uh, for everybody, including people with disabilities with, uh, with an app. Um, so our hope is that you'll really do two things throughout this discussion. Uh, the first is to think about how you might apply concepts that we discuss uh, in your cultural institution. Uh, much of the information, uh, it's our hope, will be relevant. Some of it uh, may be relevant now. Some of it may be relevant in the future. So we just really want you to think about uh, what we have to say. And then second, you know, I'd love for you to uh, think about uh, questions um, and even new concepts or ideas that you would like to share uh, with the group. We really want this to be an exchange of, of ideas. So uh, that said, Matt, why don't I turn the floor over to you? So in terms of what's going on with museums and mobile devices as well as handheld uh, objects, websites, there's a real paradigm shift from how museums are using all this and putting it together, taking full advantage of digital technology and by taking advantage of digital technology, being able to take advantage, full advantage of universal design. So I'm just gonna walk us all through what this digital ecosystem, sort of the next generation looks like. This is just very, in broad strokes, different institutions will have different takes on it, but it's gonna look, it's starting to look something like this. Some places are using it already. The ecosystem, of course, starts with the ideas, with the content, with the ideas for what we're going to communicate. Content development, content is always king, same in museums. From content, the content goes to a programmer to design how it's all going to be put together. The programmer, in turn, puts it into a content management system and that content management system lives on a server. This is where it starts being different than in the days when you would go in with a locked system and then you would be handed a device and that was it. This is a content management system uh, that lives on the server. The next thing is the server can then output what that content is to uh, an iOS-based platform, it can output it to an Android-type platform, it can output it to, uh, to a web app, it can do any of these things, and most importantly, it can do all of these things. So this is how the ecosystem starts evolving, and then it goes to the user and more and more what's happening in museums is users come in with their own mobile devices, their own smartphones, and they download the material to their smartphone, or the, as was discussed this morning, sometimes still the museums hand out uh, uh, devices on loan which are used at the museum. The next interesting, the last interesting component to it is that not only is the material that is embedded within the tour, 
within what the user has access to, but also maps, GPS. So for instance, uh, either it can start with a map uh, of a site and then it can, the system can call up information about where the location is, particularly going into what uh, Dwayne just talked about and so on and so forth, so that not only would you be seeing the artifacts, but you could be seeing history, you could be seeing whatever preferences are set up for it. And uh, GPS, either for where the objects originated from, or GPS internally within the museum itself, within the institution itself. All of that's possible. And then finally, the other piece of this ecosystem is social media. And yes, there's, we're not, I'm not specifically pointing right now or, or addressing social media in terms of back and forth dialogue, although there is a point. There, there is, that's a part of it. The more important thing is, just yesterday, Nina was telling me that I think the Minneapolis Museum is setting up its own social networking site with points. With it's, it's a whole new way of thinking about developing the use of social media, first of all, to build the audience, and second of all, to monetize the experience. While we're talking about monetizing the experience, what we're also seeing in some of the museums using this, several in Canada, for instance, is that of course, all this information uh, is free within the museum tour experience, but museums are starting to charge a modest fee for users to be able to use this content off-site. And I have some very surprising numbers of thousands of, of downloads at a five to $10 a piece price for people downloading this content for their own for their own use off-site. So the whole social media experience and the whole use of this digital museum ecosystem is not only a much more cost-effective way to approach the experience, but it's also the logical and it's actually happening already, the new way to monetize the experience as well. And uh, so that's, that's a look at how the new ecosystem is. I specifically, in the social media, um, the Smithsonian has a very exciting social media based experience, which Nancy is going to be talking about. And so I think, Nancy, this would be a good time for you to uh, okay. continue the discussion. Okay. Anyway, um, so just very quickly a couple of things. Um, the real opportunity that we've recognized with mobile at the Smithsonian, in contrast, say, to the earlier generations of mobile devices um, it, which have been around in museums as Loic Talon um, famously uncovered for us since the 1950s, is their connected nature. The fact that the new generation of smartphone devices make accessibility to conversations and to content anytime, anywhere, for in just about anyone, um, possible at a scale that was not previously possible. Um, and so we've really kind of taken that and, and, and encapsulated it in a sort of a vision statement for our use of mobile at the Smithsonian, that we want to use the connected nature of these devices and their u near ubiquity now to um, recruit the world to help us with our mission, which is the increase in diffusion of knowledge. So we're aiming not just to put content and experiences on mobile devices so that they fit in people's pockets, they take them with them everywhere, but we actually want to put the institution, its future, the fulfillment of its mission, in the hands, metaphorically, of our audiences around the world. Um, this is, as all things, I'm actually a classicist by training, not new. We've been crowdsourcing at the Smithsonian since the invention of the telegraph in the 19th century, and today we have more volunteers than staff. So this is kind of a new concept, uh, I mean an old concept with new tools at the Smithsonian. 
The other piece of this puzzle I just want to put into place before I um, delve into what Matt introduced is our mobile product development principles. And our number one principle is that good mobile products are accessible. Unlike this slide, which is very difficult to read, um, they should be used to enable access um, to the Smithsonian's experiences and resources for people of all abilities. And this is not just to fulfill legal requirements, but, but, but because our experience is that when a, a product is divined, designed for universal access, it's simply a better product for everybody. Um, other kind of principles I'll pick out of this um, list, and all of this is online if anybody wants to read it at length, is we want to use mobile to create new opportunities for engagement, so not just port old um, opportunities onto new platforms. Um, thinking of mobile as social media and also creating it in reusable ways um, so that uh, what we build can be open sourced where possible and shared with others. So on that note, I actually want to take this opportunity to try to recruit you all to this project to help us build more accessible mobile tools for museums. Um, and the first opportunity I got was brought by the director of the Accessibility Program Office at the Smithsonian, Beth Zebarth, who was concerned because the institution has very, very few verbal descriptions of its collection objects. And she was wondering if mobile might help. Well, yes, is the short answer, but with 137 million collection objects, frankly, we're never going to have enough staff, time, or resources to record a verbal description of everything in English, let alone in all of the languages that all of our, our audiences use. So um, this idea of recruiting the world and using mobile to crowdsource verbal descriptions actually became not just kind of a cool new thing to do with social media and, and new technologies, but the actually the only practical solution to our problem. So our first attempt at this, and we're actually currently redeveloping this app, but um, V1, if you will, is called Access American Stories. And it's really a prototype uh, that we've been piloting in the American Stories exhibition at the Museum of American History at the Smithsonian. Um, since last year. And it's built on an open source platform called Roundware. You can find out more at roundware.org, which was developed by the artist Halsey Ber Bergund to support his environmental installations that use a mobile app to crowdsource uh, participation in his artwork. And it does two very simple things. You can listen or you can speak. So you can record verbal descriptions of objects you see in the gallery, or you can listen to the recordings of others. So here's a, a view of how you can listen, and you can choose which areas of the exhibition you listen to and which voices you hear from, or you can um, record your own and upload it for others to hear. Um, I'm just going to go through this kind of quickly because I know we're um, pressed for time. When, we do, when people do contribute verbal descriptions, they do a click-through agreement that allows us to reuse that content in other ways. And they can choose to describe an object or answer a number of other questions that we've included in the app um, and then upload it. And that recording goes live in the app instantaneously. There's Wi-Fi in the gallery to facil facilitate that happening quickly. Um, and of course, as you can imagine, one of the first concerns was would people abuse this and upload um, offensive or, or, or kind of not helpful content. And um, so far, and we've had the app running for a year now, we have not had to remove anything from the app. Nobody's ever contributed anything that was offensive in any way. There have been a few false starts, false recordings that we've just pulled because they weren't very fun to hear. Um, and uh, so I just, I'll play for you a couple of, uh, do I have time to play a couple of samples? Okay. Um, so what we've gotten is not your kind of traditional, if that's the right word, um, professional audio description, our verbal description, as you can imagine, because this is from visitors to our galleries. But what we have gotten is a huge diversity of kinds of voices and ways of approaching the objects that often come with a level of emotion and engagement that in some ways um, renders the objects more accessible or at least more engaging than perhaps a very strictly accurate um, uh, verbal description in the kind of engineering drawing model. Um, this is a great example. The gentleman who did this recording came back several times over several days and recorded, I think, about 10 or 11 recordings, uh, descriptions for us. So I, what I don't know is exactly how I start the audio. Maybe you guys do that for me up there. Come here, Watson, I need you. Alexander Graham Bell's big box telephone, 1876, one of the first commercially available telephones. Basically, it's a piece of wood supporting a U-shaped magnet at the back. 
behind a block of wood, and that block of wood supports the speaker, and perhaps that doubles as the microphone as well. The electricity would be transmitted to and from this device through the windings at the pole ends of the magnet, and that's what evolved into our telephones hung on the wall and on the desks and now into our hands today. Okay. And I mean, I, I know you all were just looking at, uh, at an, oops, can I go back? The red one, back. No, the red one's going forward. That's interesting. Hmm. Can somebody reverse me? Because my red button is taking me forward, not back. Yeah. <laughs> well, okay, so <laughs> I have a terrible tendency to tell the punchline first in the joke. <laughs> so I'm just going to continue in that tradition today. Um, unless somebody can reverse my slides, I guess I'll just skip to the end. Oh, great. And back one more? Great. Okay, so the, um, the wooden box that you were looking at a photo of, not dissimilar from this wooden box, if you're kind of not used to looking at um, patent models and, uh, and, and early telephones, to be honest, even if you're a sighted person, you don't really know what you're looking at. And I thought that that description did a great job of kind of getting me focused in and, and understanding the technology. Um, this is another one, though, and this is kind of a different sort of verbal description, um, which helps us think about how to improve the interpretation in the gallery. Um, so if you could just start the audio on this slide for me, please. So I'm standing in front of the cotton gin, and um, I chose to do it between 1800 and 1870, even though it was patented in 1794, because it probably had the most profound effect in the years following it, not just when it was issued. Um, I thought it was really important that they noted that it did increase the enslaved African labor because it made cotton a viable cash crop. Um, if I were doing the exhibit, I would have, I guess I would have emphasized how bittersweet the cotton gin was because even though economically and technologically it was very important and profound, it probably kept slavery around for another 50 years, which is obviously not something to be proud of. So, yeah, really great when we take the time to listen to our visitors. Um, and this is another suggestion from a young, uh, young visitor. Uh, if you could play the audio on this one. Hi. Um, me and my grandma went to your museum today, and for anyone who has not gone, it's a great experience. But um, I thought it w we thought it would be cool if um, you had one of the, maybe a first edition of the Obama Spider-Man comic book that was released when Obama was inaugurated. So yeah, we thought that'd be cool. Okay. <laughs> so this is not yet in the exhibition, but uh, we, we're thinking about it. So. Um, Anyway, so as you can hear, quite a range of voices and approaches. We also have people discussing, recording themselves discussing objects. So it's a wonderful opportunity for engagement, both, both for people who are blind or, or, or have low vision and for those who are doing the recordings. And by the way, I should also emphasize that we certainly don't dissuade anyone, regardless of their sight capability, from recording a description. And um, as I'm sure if you follow the work of Art Beyond Sight, you'll know, um, you know there's really interesting um, creative output from artists who are blind and visual descriptions um, from people who have low vision uh, that, that are certainly fascinating and engaging to listen to and open our eyes in new ways. Um, so, sorry, yes, of course. Thank you for your question. I should have mentioned at the beginning that the app can include professional uh, museum authored content as well as crowdsourced content. And we actually have a bit of both. Over 85% of the content is contributed by visitors. Um, so there are, I would call them semi professional descriptions, um, recorded not by professional verbal describers, but, but by staff who have been trained in those skills. Um, and then the majority of it is contributed by visitors. So that's the, the kind of the balance we have right now. And there's a, an issue around that that I was just going to address in these learnings. But do feel free to follow up with another question if you want to do that. I understand. 
Um, and like I said, with 137 million objects, I'm not sure how long it's going to take us to get that for every one of them, but we're doing our best here. Um, so key learnings from, from the, uh, uh, this project have been that the, the biggest problem we have is the lack of a marketing budget or any marketing effort, so people don't necessarily know it's there, um, which means that we're not crowdsourcing as much as I think we could. Um, the second is that for sighted vis visitors, audio tours are the standard, and that's kind of what they expect from a museum app in a gallery. And so they're surprised to be hearing these descriptions um, and not a kind of a traditional curatorial audio tour. Um, and another point that comes along with that is people, uh, we, in the current interface to the app, you choose between museum voice, professional voice, and visitor voice. And people instinctively go for the voice of authority. So they're choosing to hear the museum voice. Well, actually, that means they're missing the majority of the content and some really great content. Um, and in fact, what we've found is, depending on how you ask the question, if you just say to people, would you rather hear from the curator or from Joe Bloggs on the street, of course they're going to say, I want to hear from the expert. But if you say, would you rather hear from the curator or the grandchild of the first man to walk on the moon about what the stories were that you know, were brought home, then that kind of changes the, the perception of that visitor, that, that non-professional, that crowdsourced content. Um, so we're actually going to be redeveloping the interface to remove that distinction um, because we think that it's actually misleading people um, and, and playing into certain kind of um, preconceptions about quality that are not necessarily borne out by the app. And finally, the most important thing that we've found is that people are highly motivated to contribute because they feel like they're part of something bigger than themselves. They feel like they're doing something that's important. And we haven't gamified this. I mean, they're not winning badges or points or coupons or anything like that. But it's just kind of the pleasure of being part of something bigger than themselves. Um, so we're going to be redeveloping it um, to, uh, inc to add questions that invite people to participate based on their kinds of motivations. Um, so object people, uh, the verbal descriptions already do a great job of getting folks to take a closer look whether they're recording or listening. Um, to contribute American stories, so people people, people who like to hear about people um, can contribute and listen to stories about the objects from the human perspective. And then ideas people um, through kind of did you know, what, what important facts do we need to know about the cotton gin or, or Alexander Graham Bell's first uh, telephone. And finally for physical, for kind of people who learn more through sensory immersion and experiences contributing American um, including in the app uh, American music from each period that they can listen to as they uh, see the different objects in the um, timed the um, timeline organized exhibition. Um, and uh, then we're going to have different actions that you can, uh, activities you can engage in with each object as well. So liking or listening to more like this, describing the object, tell us a story about the object, and what do you think people should know about this object or the kind of the interface prompts that will be in there. Um, and so I, I, I'm be obviously happy to answer questions, but I thought I would end, I added this at the last minute inspired by um, the presentations this morning and earlier, that I think in addition to this kind of crowdsourcing effort, another area for us to look at is rich with potential for increasing both engagement and accessibility to museums are paradigms like immersive theater, and I've had the pleasure um, just recently of seeing both Sleep No More and Then She Fell. It's really fascinating ways of engaging people in narratives through different entry points that can, so that different parts of the story can be told in different ways to engage people with different abilities. 3D printing, as we heard the fantastic panel preceding us, this is uh, just Dita, in, in the mood of Sleep No More and Then She Fell, Dita Von Teese's 3D printed gown, um, and also augmented reality. And uh, there's a, the next issue of Curator Journal coming out is on accessibility and includes an article by Eleanor Lisney um, who's talking about how augmented reality and other technologies have been used by artists and others in the UK um, to increase accessibility to certain um, uh, experiences. So I do invite you to check that out and um, I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Crossman. 
So I'm, I'm just really curious, um, of those of you who are here representing cultural institutions, how many of you are using or drawing on personal mobile devices to enhance um, the experience of your, of your visitors, uh, including those with disabilities? Okay, okay. And how many are interested in, in learning more about this? Okay, fantastic. Um, so before we go on to uh, q and A, I'm just gonna give a few basic next steps that you might wanna consider if you are interested in drawing on um, personal mobile devices with the universal design to enhance uh, access in your cultural institution. The first thing that I would highly recommend is that you know who your visitors are. Um, you know, this is a theme that we've heard throughout the day in terms of really connecting with your visitors, understanding what their needs are. So often we get caught up in accommodations and a disability and we ne neglect to understand what the real interests of the visitors are. Um, and how they like to use, um, if it's technology, uh, different types of accommodations. I'll give you an example. I have a friend who um, is blind and she was telling me about an experience at a museum where um, she was given about three volumes of exhibits in Braille and she was explaining to me that she's just not a very fast Braille reader and she wasn't gonna you know, go through all of those volumes but she would have loved to have had an app that would have allowed her to go through the content to identify exactly what she wanted to learn more about. So I think it's really important to understand who your visitors are. Um, another thing that you'll want to do is build a long-term technology plan that includes mobile, tablet, and web implementation. Um, we've talked about getting input from people with disabilities. This is something that you can't do alone. You're going to have to connect with your colleagues in, in the museum, uh, in different departments, um, in order to actually build uh, a sustainable long-term technology plan. Um, and as you're doing this, you're really only going to want to acquire technology that permits accessible, friendly apps to be added. Um, and then also think about when you're building apps from scratch, and I'm gonna ask um, Dr. Proctor about this a little bit later, uh, but to consider accessibility factors when you, when you um, commission apps. Um, app developers are becoming more and more proficient when it comes to accessibility. And um, if an app developer is not aware of how to make an app accessible for multiple platforms or to meet your needs, I would highly recommend trying to find somebody else who can meet your needs and the needs of your visitors a bit better. When it comes to acquiring devices, though, um, that are accessible and that will, um, will are compatible with accessible, friend friendly apps, um, you know, Google is fantastic. Um, I will Google usability in a particular device to get a sense of um, to get a sense of how accessible it is by multiple users. Sometimes I'll go to YouTube and just put in keywords of a particular device and user with a visual impairment, user with a hearing impairment, um, and you'll get great videos, great reviews of actual users who can provide you input. Uh, and then also, I'm a member of the Google Accessibility Group. Um, I don't contribute as much as I kind of lurk and hear what people have to say about different devices, but I've learned so much in terms of accessibility features and accessibility barriers on different devices. Um, Matt talked about content management. It's really important that you only acquire content management systems that can be operated in-house by staff. You definitely want to make sure that you have the flexibility to control your content. You don't want to be dependent on a third party. Uh, and then finally, I would highly recommend you including accessibility in your staff professional development curriculum. Um, you know, you want to set your staff up for success, and you want them to be able to meet the needs of the visitors who come to see you so that they'll come back, and as somebody said earlier, so they'll come back and bring other people with them. Um, so you're going to want to make sure that they are aware of all of the uh, opportunities that are available, uh, including mobile devices, mobile apps, um, for your visitors uh, with all types of abilities. Um, so with that, I really wanted to revisit uh, one of the things that Dr. Proctor was talking about, um, and that's really kind of building the, or building the app, and we talked about this offline, building the app and, and making sure that um, it was accessible, and I was hoping that you could kind of talk about 
that process along with the options that you considered given some of the barriers that you faced? Yeah, happy to do that. I tend to be the sort of person who has to learn things the hard way um, by doing it wrong the first time. So a great example of that is um, the, the Smithsonian mobile app, which is kind of the central visitor's app. It has all of our exhibition listings and our events and maps and all of that sort of stuff. Um, we started working on that in 2010. and. Uh, we released it and, you know, very excited about voiceover and iOS and how that, you know, opens up accessibility of mobile products to our visitors and very happy also with some of the, the feedback we were getting hearing at the high rate of adoption of, of that platform, that mobile platform by people um, who are blind or have low vision. And uh, then we discovered that our app didn't work with voiceover. Um, that we'd actually managed to build it in such a way that it locked out that native baked-in functionality, which was simply because of the way that we had designed uh, the interface. Um, I won't go into the technical details, but we've actually just this week, or actually last week, uh, relaunched the app with a new interface so that those barriers are removed. Um, so one way to kind of avoid that is to really, as you say, be upfront with your developers about we really want to make sure that the app takes advantage of all of the baked in native mobile accessibility functions like voiceover um, or, or, or any text enlargement features you want to include. Um, another approach that's uh, I think can be quite successful is starting with a mobile website at the core of your mobile app. This can be much easier for in-house development, um, much more compatible with your content management system. And if you're developing your website, as you should be, um, according to the, the W3 standards, then some of that carries over as well, um, even if you then later, later wrap it in, in some sort of um, native code, native app code. So um, the key thing though is to bring this to the fore with your developers from the very beginning um, to ensure that you're not at least disabling mm -hmm. the functionality that's already there in, in most of our um, visitors' devices. Thank you. And another question for the group. How many of you all have an unlimited budget when it comes <laughs> to technology acquisition? <laughs> so yeah, I don't see any hands. Okay, so my question for Matt is, what are, what are some reasonable solutions for funding innovative technology like apps and other options? Uh, in terms of funding for, uh, for apps and for development, uh, one thing when, when Cynthia, Nancy, and I were preparing for today's presentation was that, Nancy, maybe I could just pass the microphone over to you and you could speak for a minute about the cost of developing uh, what you showed and then the cost that others can use for adapting it. Sure. Um, okay, so first of all, um, there is no budget at the Smithsonian that is yet dedicated to mobile, and I have no paid staff. So everything that we do, we have to fundraise for on a project basis, and I'm working with our museums who are coming up with funds on their own. Um, so I really feel the budget crunch. And so that's part of the reason why we try to work wherever possible with open source platforms. And Roundware, as I said, is open source. Everything we've built on top of it goes back into that code set. Um, and we're really hopeful that some of the museum people or other cultural organizations represented here might be interested in collaborating with us on further developing it. Open source is not free, um, but at least there's not a license fee and it's a starting point and hopefully there's a community which means um, we can get some economies of scale. And that's one of the main things that I do at the Smithsonian is try to connect what we do and with mobile initiatives so that we're not reinventing the wheel. Um, I think what I'm doing with the 19 museums of the Smithsonian could happen on a much larger scale. Why should we each be building our own access apps in-house alone when we could be building a common platform that we all share together? Obviously, that's, that's the ultimate crowdsourcing when it comes to funding. And uh, another, another couple ideas that we've been talking about are, first of all, uh, many of the schools, for instance, uh, NYU's um, uh, technology program, uh, the ITP program, uh, there's one at SVA, of course MIT has one. All of these programs have grad student projects and many times uh, these institutions reach out to organizations or organizations connect with the institutions and you can 
get uh, a grad student who that becomes their thesis to work with you on it. It's not a perfect situation since they're grad students, but some very good things can come out of that as a, another way for low cost or no cost uh, development. A third idea which, which Cynthia and I were uh, talking about was, you know, it's, it's typical that even in a room like this, somebody endows a chair. I don't mean like in a university, I mean a chair. Mm -hmm. But somebody will give five, ten thousand dollars to have their name on the back of a chair in a museum or in a religious institution or whatever. We were thinking that it would be possible to, in terms of a new creative type of fundraising, offer that somebody could donate, could endow software development for a particular uh, system, either whether it's a social media system or otherwise, in a cultural institution. And I don't know that it's ever been tried, but why not? And in terms of reaching those few uh, affluent people in their 20s that have found jobs or their 30s, um, it might be a way to strike a, strike a connection with them in terms of instead of endowing a piece of furniture, endow a piece of software, just as an idea. Thank you. All right, does anybody have any questions for our panelists? Thanks very much, very informative. Dr. Proctor, um, have you addressed at all the concern that I would have about many people still not having a smartphone? Do you have devices that are available to be used uh, for people who don't have their own mm. smartphone? Thank you very much for that question. Um, we are addressing it. I'll be honest with you, the Smithsonian, for uh, various long and complicated historical reasons, um, has never had the kind of in-house mobile program that you find commonly at museums like MoMA or at the Met. And um, so handing out devices to people who don't come with their own is a fairly frightening proposition for us. Um, and we're, we're warming up to it. And um, uh, Beth Seabarth, the director of our accessibility program office, has invested in a small number of devices for use with this pilot I talked about, the Access American Stories. But frankly, I do feel like there's going to be a role for a very long time, if not forever, um, for a, a, a kind of a small fleet, a pool of, of devices for people to borrow um, if they don't have their own or if they don't want to use their own. And um, the Whitney actually, and Danielle Linser is here, she's, I should mention also one of the authors in the um, accessibility issue of Curator, talks about their program. They've done a lot of research into mobile use um, or use of mobile devices by their visitors. And one of the things that they found early on is that in New York City, people don't necessarily want to use their own phone, even if they have it with them, because they don't want to run down the battery. So, you know, maybe we need to include char recharging stations or loan out spare batteries, or maybe we need to have devices. So, you know, we want to make sure that the digital divide does not increase with mobile. Um, there's a lot of indication that actually mobile unlike fixed web, is more accessible economically. For many people, their, their smartphone is their first and only tool for connecting to the internet, so it's helping a little bit, but you know, I, I completely agree with that sentiment, and, and I hope we're gonna get there soon at the Smithsonian to be able to hand out devices to everyone who needs one. Thank you, Dr. Proctor. I think we have a question. <laughs> You guys can call me Nancy, by the way. <laughs> yeah, it's been great because we're just about to develop something like this. Um, so just clarify. People come into the museum. They see an object. They get on their phone. They talk about it. Then you edit. You take that and use it. You upload it so other with the application or just instantly, you said? The, the software does everything for us. Because okay. uh, again, we, we don't really have any staff for this. Well, there's, there's a wonderful person who works for Beth uh, named Patrick Gore who goes in and he does listen to everything that's been contributed, you know, once or twice a week. Um, but uh, it, it all goes live instantly. And, and, and that's actually an important part of the user experience, too. Um, like I said, people are highly motivated to contribute if they can see that they're making a difference, or in this case, hear that they're making a difference. So as soon, soon as you've recorded a message, to be able to hear it play back, you kind of know, oh, right, you know, you've, you've closed the loop. That's 
very interesting. Thank yeah. you. Any other questions? Sorry, we're Sorry. wondering if you have access about um, accuracy of content. Yes, of course. I mean, this is a primary concern um, with museums who, you know, whose authority and brand is really built on subject matter expertise and reliability, and we wouldn't want to do anything to undermine that. And I think what's interesting when you're looking at crowdsourcing projects is thinking about things that people can do and, and do very well even if they're not subject matter experts. So what we're not asking people to do is, you know, tell us the history of, of telephony in the United States. We're asking them to describe what they're looking at. And what we're finding is that we're quite often getting more than that um, in a very positive direction. So for example, a description of the first Apple Mac computer described by a woman who used to program on one of those. And so she talks not just about what the keyboard looks like, but what it used to feel like, the pressure on the keys and the responsiveness, um, and gets very passionate about it, and the sound of the floppy drive as it went in and out. Um, so I think what we're, what we're looking at is asking, what can visitors bring, expert or not, that we may not be able or think to put into the mix. So this is not either curatorial voices or crowdsourced voices, it's both and. Um, and actually, I uh, was at Then She Fell last night, an uh, immersive participatory theater piece, and they had another great solution for getting people to in involved and to participate, even though I'm, I'm certainly no actress, would not feel up to playing a role in a piece. But I was asked, do you take dictation? Yes and I wrote down what the actor said on a piece of paper and then that became a prop in the show. So if you think of ways that people can contribute and participate meaningfully that doesn't require them necessarily to have a particular background, I think the rewards can go beyond the work product. Um, it's about the process of getting them involved and the overall mission of the institution is probably more valuable even than the quote unquote money you might have saved um, uh, in working with the crowd as opposed to with people you hire to do the same work. So, so I think we have time for one more question before we wrap up. Where's the mic? Hi, I know this is new technology, but have you gotten any responses from people with visual loss about the oh, reactions yes. to it? Yes, yes, sorry, I should have said we've, you know, we've prototyped and tested this with people who are blind and have low vision and um, well I mean one of the funny things we found is probably the only app in history to be more accessible to people who are blind than to sighted people. The interface as you saw is for sighted people not that engaging and that's one of the reasons why we're redefine, redefining it. But um, the the main criticism, uh, really the only um, ask that, that we got from um, testers to change the app to improve its accessibility was we didn't have, um, or we still don't have actually, an interior positioning system that means that we know we can be, we can reassure you that you're standing in front of the ruby slippers and not Kermit the Frog. Um, and that's, that is a technology limitation. Um, we think we found a way to work with that, that we're gonna be piloting um, in the next a uh, few months, I hope, if I can get something through contracting, um, which is using the camera on your phone to visually recognize the object that you're in front of. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, that is a final piece of the puzzle that when we put it in place, it's gonna increase accessibility for a whole range of people to have very accurate indoor positioning. And of course, Google's been doing some really important work on that too with Google Indoor Maps. A lot of smart people are working on it. We're not quite there, but we're getting closer. Well, I thank you all. Uh, well, I thank the panelists for um, their insightful uh, remarks, and I uh, thank you all for your interest in this topic. I would encourage you all to keep the discussion going amongst yourselves and with us. Our contact information is up and will be available um, shortly after the program to engage in, in further discussion. So thank you.